Okay, all right. Hello to everybody. Greetings, I wanna give a few moments for folks to join in and then we'll get started in about one minute. Thank you so much for everybody who's joined. Thank you to the African Women's Development Fund and to Black Women Radicals for hosting such a needed and necessary event. All right, everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good, ever, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome, welcome to everybody. Welcome to Health, Equity, and Power, Building Trans Transnational Feminist Solidarity. My name is Nana Brantuo, and I will be your moderator for today. I wanna thank our hosts, the African Women's Development Fund and Black Women Radicals for conceptualizing and hosting this event at such a timely and necessary moment. I want to begin with introducing our esteemed guest, and I want to thank them once again for making time and space for joining us today. So I would like to start with Dr. Anna Makumbi. Uh, Dr. Anna Makumbi is Associate Professor of Cardiology in the Faculty of Medicine at Eduardo Modolin University, member of the Scientific Council of the High School of Health Sciences in Mozambique and head of the Non-Communicable Diseases Division in Mozambique's National Health Institute, and Professor Makumbi also chairs the Lancet NCDI Poverty Commission. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so, I want to just give a heads up that we are in the background and we are working through and ensuring that interpretation is working. And so I am going to continue on with the, reading the biographies and then give a pause for us to sort of talk through any tech issues that may encounter and then we can go on with it overall program. Next, we have Dr. Kia Caldwell. Dr. Kia Caldwell is Associate Cultural Anthropologist and Professor of African, African American and Diaspora Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on race, gender, Black feminism, anti-racism and health in Brazil and the United States. She's the author of Health Equity in Brazil, Intersections of Gender, Race and Policy, and Negras in Brazil, Re-Envisioning Black Women, Citizenship, and the Politics of Identity. Her current research focuses on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on Black communities in Brazil and how Black women have re-envisioned democracy and human rights through activism and office holding across the Americas. Thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Makumbi. Next, Jamie Swift. Having an affinity for storytelling, Jamie Smith Swift is a truth seeker at heart. She holds a bachelor's of arts in communications and a master's of arts in political science from Temple University and Howard University respectively. Swift is passionate about black feminist politics and leadership in Africa and the African diaspora and is the founder and executive director of Black Women Radicals, a black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting and centering black women, ra women's radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. And Pranso Mafeti, who is the interim director of programs at the African Women's Development Fund. She has over 15 years as a creative, natural leader, facilitator, and mentor, and, expert, and has expertise in philanthropy and women and girls' rights. She is experienced in strategy and program development and implementation, grant making, management, fundraising, training and facilitation. Thank you all to our speakers who are here. And last but not least is Wima Askri. Wima Askri is a non-binary queer activist passionate about empowering the LGBTQIA community in Tunisia and Africa and raising awareness about their issues. Wima was born and raised in Tunisia as a chair and member of the Board of Directors at African Queer Youth Initiative, they are responsible for initiating and leading the African Queer Youth Initiative's strategic planning process and facilitating and directing activities. They are also the coordinator of Mutuadim Queer Festival, Film Festival in, it, in its third edition and is now project officer working with queer refugees and asylum seekers in Tunisia. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Thank you to our host for convening such a necessary space. Give me one minute because I also want to engage with you all in the chat. 
And so I wanted to just post a question to you all, feel free to answer. But what brings you here today? What are your hopes for this session? And what do you hope to learn more about? And so just to give a run through of how today will work, um, we'll begin with an opening conversation between Pansel and Jamie as they talk about their reflections on the transnational feminist solidarity movement. Then there will be a digitized tribute um, that focuses on health equity issues and the selected stories of women's organizing in Africa and the African diaspora. We'll then delve into non-communicable non diseases and their impact of the case as related to African and Afro-descendant women and gender expansive persons, which will come from Dr. Anna Makumbi. We'll then make space for audience engagement and we'll delve into our final presentations that focus on intergenerational and intersectional perspectives on health equity as well as Afro-Brazilian women and their transforming health equity and comprehensive well-being. And that will be followed by the event closing and conversation. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us. I would now like to see if Panso and Jamie are ready to engage in our beginning reflection and conversation. Yes. Thank you all, yes, thank you so much. It is very lovely to see your faces this morning <laughs> on my end. Yes. Yes, my morning too. So thank you, Nana, for being such a gracious host. I'm so excited to be here with Pond, so definitely. Of course, I mean, this is, this is what the movement is about, right? We are using digital technology to really transform things. And we're talking about figuring out, well, when do we, when do we plan things? When do we time things? Who are we yeah. centering? How are we using our, all that's available to us to really like a, get to and really work towards liberation? So I'm grateful yeah. to be here. So I wanted to start with a quote, just to ground our conversation and the sentiments for today from Nawal El Sadawi. And this is from The Hidden Face of Eve, which for folks who haven't, please pick up a copy. It's, it's fundamental to just learning more about the work that she played in the movement as a writer, as an activist, doctor, so on and so forth. And the quote is, it is necessary that women unite everywhere to strengthen and broaden their movement towards liberation. Mm -hmm. And solidarity between women can be a powerful force of change and it can influence future development in ways favorable, not only to women, but to all members of our society. And so I wanted you all to hear that. I wanted everybody in our audience to hear that and then pose a question to you. What are your reflections on the feminist movement in Africa and throughout the diaspora? What are some strengths? What's one strength and maybe one challenge that you've witnessed in particular during the contemporary moment that is this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Jamie, do you want to start? Oh, <laughs> I knew you were gonna do that. I knew you were gonna do that. Um, I just, <laughs> thank you, Nana, for your question. I would like to just, um, you know, add that the reason why I was able to um, understand health equity more, particularly among black women and gender expansive people was because it hit home for myself with my mother um, who was diagnosed with renal kidney failure when I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And then she had a kidney transplant years later for the kidney to fail um, after a month. And then she had another kidney transplant years later. Um, and I didn't make these critical connections until it happened, impacted me um, at home, right? And then I started to see these broader connections of particularly like the black community um, um, being being plagued by these health inequities, right? Lack of access to healthcare, um, um, you know, medical apartheid, like uh, Harriet Washington talks about in her in her critical book, right? And I started to see that we have to have a diasporic and transnational lens when it comes to these conversations, not just only about um, health equity in the sense of you know going to the doctor, but also how the state and uh, enacts health inequities as well, right? And so mm -hmm. that started to you know, make me have grander conversations and wanting to learn more about how other black people, particularly black women and gender expansive folks fared in their cultural context and political context that they're in when it comes to health inequities in, in Africa and the African diaspora. One thing mm -hmm. I love about this moment, particularly with the coronavirus is that we're able to connect and talk about these issues online, right? But it's the sad thing is, is that the coronavirus is devastating our communities in the diaspora, mm -hmm. um, disproportionately impacting Black and Afro-descendant people around the world. And so this is why this is such a critical time. And I think 
one thing we need to do is like really have this transnational internationalist lens and recognize it's not just black Americans in the United States, but it's black and Afro descendant people um, and particularly black women and gender expansive folks on the front lines to, to uh, combat these issues. We've, we've always been on the front lines. And so, um, yes. Yeah. I think, you know, as Jamie said, a lot of my own personal sort of um, experience also speaks to my, you know, my mum. And I think when I think about her sort of journey through being in the health sector, actually, she was one of the kind of Commonwealth citizens who was invited to the UK to do her nursing training there. So was received her training in a system that was very much about a colonial response to health. She returned to Southern Africa, which is where um, you know, she was born and where she's from, and was charged with setting up a health system in a context that was very much informed by the colonial government of the time, but needed to respond to the majority black population. And particularly within that, setting up a system that responded to women in Southern Africa in a way that reflected their own needs and their own priorities. So for me, that was hugely, hugely informative. And I think what I found in my own life is having lived across Africa, in the UK and the US, that as a black woman, this, the struggles and the issues have been the same amongst my sisters wherever in the world I've been. So whether it's the type of health issues, whether it's been the responses from the health systems to those issues, or whether it's been about our own understanding of those issues, because they're often presented to us in ways that don't speak to our own experience. So for me, understanding how we as black women and gender expansive people across the world see our own needs in a system that wasn't necessarily designed for those or for those priorities has become a, re a significant part of what I now do and what we as the African Women's Development Fund are doing, which is about supporting the feminist movement but very much in solidarity with the feminist movement across the world, because the challenges and the struggles and the hopes and the dreams that we all have will only be realized if we work collectively. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both. Um, both of your reflections are making me think of how this convening this, what we're doing here today is definitely necessary it's definitely emerging and making it's, it's historic in ways but also follows in line of a legacy i find black women have always been organizing creating spaces creating programs to address these needs because we understand we function within a state we function within states typically that fail us it doesn't matter if it's led by black people white people or otherwise and i'm wondering for you all like in knowing that and recognizing that, because I know for me, I have just been so amazed by the level of organizing and advocacy that folks have been able to do. I'm wondering what are some maybe cases or strategies or things you've seen emerging throughout this period that have just been like, wow, this is really contributing to our building, not just as a transnational movement, but as an African, African descendant movement. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There are so many examples of the work that I like to say, uh, work that's being done. I like to say that um, we in the contemporary are but one iteration, one speck of this long legacy of, of Black feminists doing the work, right? And it's amazing to see that and always in dire constraints or dire times, Black women and gender expansive people are always on the front lines doing the work, right? And we can mm -hmm. see that with particularly last year with, with mutual aid. Um, um, there is a groups in the DC area, um, particularly organizing for um, um, uh, black communities in Southeast and Southwest who did not have access to toilet paper or food or, or weren't even getting their mail and they would organize, right? And, and buy groceries and, and do mutual aid, right? And then there's also communities in Brazil. We, all, we know Brazil right now with the coronavirus is 
is, is horrific, the, the rates and the numbers. And there's different organizers um, for an uh, Adara Women's Institute in South, a Black Women's Institute in Salvador has done critical work in aiding communities and families and bringing attention to um, the coronavirus when the government, the state <laughs> refuses to do so, right? And so mm -hmm. how do we look at these examples as not just like current in the moment responses to uh, uh, dire constraints, like which is, which is what we have to contend with all the time, but as a part of a long legacy of black women and gender expansive people organizing. So how can we go back to the root of these things? How can we, um, you know, I like to talk about the Akan word Sankofa. How do we go back and fetch these long strategies and these long practices and these long organizing tools that we've always done, um, to be principled in our study about them, continue the legacy and build on that for future generations to come. Mm -hmm. And just sort of adding on from what Jamie's just said, I think one of the things that is, you know, that has been known for a long time, but about which we're trying now to be much more purposeful is that often, you know, uh, black women and gender expansive people all over the world just get on and get stuff done. And um, there has traditionally, particularly in these uh, international development space being this obsession with documenting processes and learning and impact in a very let's say globalized north way so certain ways of proving whether or not something is successful that has always felt like it's not about an understanding and ownership amongst those communities but about a fit to one way of saying, yes, this is valid, this is what works. So something that we're doing a lot more now is developing evidence guides, which are based in the knowledge, in the experience, in the storytelling of black women and gender expansive people so that they own that. And so that we build a greater recognition of the value of us owning our own narratives and telling our own stories of change and making the case for doing things in ways that we know work for us and you know contribute to the broader sort of you know field of learning um, from which I think we have tended to be used for extraction rather than actually owning. Thank you all so much for these perspectives it's now making me think specifically to you two and the organizations and the work that you had in recognizing the necessity of ownership and, and creating our own rubrics, our own standards for evaluation. Um, I'm really, I'm always partial to and appreciative of those who use their space for knowledge production and also just facilitating conversation mm -hmm. throughout the movement. And I wanted to learn more from you about just things you've learned over time in creating space. Like, what does it mean? I know for me, for instance, I have a practice of should I be the one speaking? Who do I bring into this space? Especially mm -hmm. acknowledging my privileges that come as being cisgender and, and acknowledging the, the marginalizations that happen throughout the community. So what have you been learning about creating space within the movement and what do you think folks can learn from your okay. praxis? Definitely, that's such a great question, Nana. And I think it's our responsibility as black feminists if you identify as a black feminist to center the most marginalized or the most marginal in our communities. And um, that's what that, that is about to me. Um, and that's not just domestically in the United States where, where I am, but transnationally as well. I'm always, you, you know, you and I work closely together, Nana, and I'm always saying like, I don't wanna host this because I do not, this is not my identity, right? Like, I, I think that's what it's about, it's about supporting black feminists, supporting black women, supporting gender expansive people and really allowing or not allowing, but centering and making sure that um, um, people who've been ostracized, overlooked, neglected, um, attempted like erasure, erase to be centered in these conversations. And how does that work? That means taking a step back. That means like you said, acknowledging your uh, like our privileges, um, even with, with even being mar in a part of that marginalized community, right? Um, it's acknowledging what's going around in the world or on in the world. Um, and yes, like I said, it's it's about decolonizing our our, our minds and really recentering 
or centering a radical praxis, right? And you do that, I believe, through principled study, uh, re, uh, you know, learning about what other people have done before you. You do that mm -hmm. through community building, right? And engaging in the, and, and knowing the people in your community. And I think that's why we um, have these amazing events and I get to be with these amazing organizations and like the African Women's Development Fund because yes, I'm talking, but I'm also learning as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we should be humble that we, we don't have all the answers, right? That, but that we're actively learning um, all the time. So I think that's how we, we do it. Yeah. And, you know, without wanting to repeat what Jamie said, I, I absolutely hear that and, and, and would say very much the same. Um, and I think in addition to the, you know, the, the connections that we make between each other, I think for me, it's so important because it also expands our own networks and you know, uh, creates greater linkages to more groups that we know individually, but can learn from and ensure um, have the opportunity to be in those spaces where conversations are happening. I do also think another thing, and this perhaps comes a bit from my experience spending a long time in the UK international development sector, is also, um, you know, there is a bit of, in that sector, wanting to invite people who sound a lot like you. So I think also pushing to ensure that there is a real understanding of who really does represent the communities, because amongst ourselves, um, you know, we should have those connections and should ensure that those are the voices that are prioritized. Absolutely. I wanted to ask now this sort of concluding question for this section before moving forward. And what do you hope to hear and learn and take forward from this event? You know, oftentimes you put together an event and there's no time to sit and say like, well, what am I hoping for? What do I, you know, <laughs> or I'm prepping my notes, you know, so I wanted to hear from you all. What do you hope to take from today? Listen, I'm here to to learn from these amazing panelists and their perspective, and their perspectives, right, on the work that they're doing, but also insights on whether what other Black and Afro descendant and African feminists are doing in their their respective contexts. Uh, we have a lot to learn from one another. Um, we should be constantly in conversation with one another, right? We hear about tensions in the diaspora, right, but we we really need to talk about, yes, these tensions are here, but where do we go from here? What are the solutions, right? And so I think this is a part of a solution. This is part of community building. Uh, this is part of diasporic movement building, Black feminist diasporic movement building, right? And so how can we take what we learned today and do more uh, individual study? I keep going back to studying, right? Because it's, it's about being principled. It's about uh, uh, your desire of wanting to learn more, right? And to decolonize yourself because yes, we can give you some of these tools, but what about what we do with it afterwards? So what, what is going on on the African continent in terms of health inequities? Who are the people doing the work? Um, um, how, are, how are people addressing state violence on the continent at this moment? We've seen a lot of uprisings mm -hmm. happening. What is going on in the continent? Are we, uh, are we um, aware of these things, right? And so I, think that is what I'm looking forward to. And also tools to, to connect to greater understandings of health inequity. Um, that just doesn't happen to black Americans, but like I said, black people and Afro descended people around the world. So mm -hmm. yes, this is all of this. I'm super excited. Yeah. And ditto what Jamie has just said, just a real excitement about really understanding and hearing from some of those at the forefront of these conversations, what the issues are. And I'm, I'm particularly excited because there's so many different perspectives and it's taking health, not just as a I'm ill, go to hospital thing, but as a much broader, you know, black women and gender expansive fundamental right and looking at it very much from that perspective. So I'm looking forward to that and to also to this being start of an ongoing conversation. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you both so much, yes. And I really wanted to sit with, before we go to the next uh, portion where we'll be watching the video, I wanted to thank you both for bringing up this point of that this is something we've been doing for a long time. So to learn from each other and to learn from the past. And there is so much that's just recorded. And I think of, 
the work that Black women have done over time too, and then gender expansive folks, African African diaspora folks, the work that we've been doing constantly to address our needs. I wanted to share in the chat, um, I'm working on my dissertation and I get to focus on Black women migrants who, edu who educate for educational purposes, past and present. Most of them have been nurses, have been doctors, have taken on this field of health, public health and ensuring our needs. And this document that I've shared is from 1913. Um, and reading more about this black woman who was coming from Canada, Dr. Sophia Jones, came from Canada, was educated, and was one of the first women to get a medical degree at the University of Michigan, went to establish the nursing program at Spelman, and was teaching and establishing spaces for folks to learn and talk about health and public health all, like, all throughout her career. So just a powerful testament, one of many, that this is work we've been doing. So I'm really grateful that you all are opening this space today. And so now we can move forward to presenting the digitized tribute, which focuses on health equity issues and selected stories of women's organizing in Africa and the diaspora. Now we'll step out the way and allow Dina to take over. Um, thank you so much, Nana. Um, so for this session, like Nana mentioned, I'm going to be sharing um, a video um, and as I try to share my screen, um, there we go. So this is, before we start the video share, I just wanted to briefly highlight what it's about. So we put together a very small clip that um, provides statistical and qualitative analysis on uh, some of the issues that underpin health inequities um, for African Afro-descent and um, gender expansive women and persons. And um, the idea was really to just highlight how similar some of the things that we do experience are, um, but also showcase um, what our story in organizing, as, as we heard from um, Jamie and Ponso, what our organizing story has been, what our activism has been. So showcasing some of the um, women and gender expansive persons that have been and continue to lead change um, to be able to address some of the, the issues that um, compound inequities when it comes to health equity services and programs on the continent and in the diaspora. So I will start this now. And Afro-descent women and gender expansive persons lose their lives to preventable killers globally. Our quest for health equity is a tale of oppression, poverty, exclusion, and state-driven violence. It is also a tale of regimes of activism, organizing, and women-led programming for inclusive health futures. Through this tale, we learned that the challenges impeding our equitable benefits from health services and policies bear significant similarities and know no boundaries. Here are a few constructs to show this. Globally, millions of women are in the lowest paid work, earning 24% less than men. In developing regions, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, 75% of women are in the informal economy with limited legal rights or protection. This means that millions of us lack financial autonomy and earn less to escape poverty or boost our ability to demand and spend on healthcare. More than other categories, African, Afro-descent and gender expansive persons bear the disproportionate brunt of global health pandemics. We look at the case of maternal health and non-communicable diseases. In the United States, infants born to African-American women are 1.5 to 3 times more likely to die than infants born to women of other races or ethnicities. In Latin America and the Caribbean, while maternal mortality fell from 88 per 100,000 live births in 2005 to 74 in 2017, several countries in the region still have a ratio above the target 3.1 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Similarly, in the United Kingdom, Black women are reported to be five times more likely than white women to die from complications in their pregnancy. 
In 2017, Sub-Saharan Africa accounted for two-thirds of the world's maternal deaths. Globally, non-communicable diseases, including neurological conditions, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, and mental health needs claim the lives of up to 16.8 million women. In a 2019 continent-wide study, the African Women's Development Fund found that over 300 million African women were directly affected by NCDs with a double caretaking burden. Compared to their white British peers, black women living in the UK are reported as having poor prognosis and more significant morbidity from treatable and preventable health conditions like diabetes, cervical cancer, and heart disease. State-driven violence, anti-blackness, trans and homophobia perpetuate environments of terror and systemic exclusion of women from accessing comprehensive health care and living a life of dignity. In 2019, the Human Rights Campaign reported that at least 25 transgender or gender non-conforming people were murdered by violent means. 91% of these were black women, 81% under the age of 30, and 68% lived in the southern region of the US. Still, in 2019, the tolerance level for coexistence with LGBTQ plus individuals or communities ranged from 3% in Senegal to 26% in Swaziland in a 33 country study on the African continent. In Brazil, Black transgender women are more likely to be victims of violence. Yet, we still dare to challenge, as individuals or collectively, African, Afro-descent women and gender expansive persons have remained committed to leading the activism, organizing and action that seeks to address these barriers. Crystal Simoni is an African feminist using the Naui Collective to build a community that analyzes macroeconomic policy and programming using a feminist lens. Challenging exclusionary macroeconomic politics has the potential to position women as critical drivers of the health equity agenda. Kia Brown is an African-American activist and author of The Pretty One on Life, pop culture, disability, and other reasons to fall in love with me. She uses social media to advocate for body positivity among African-American women living with disability by sharing her experiences about living with cerebral palsy. The Silent Majority Ghana is a group of Ghanaian feminists and LBTQ people who coordinate, raise awareness, and support women and LGBTQ people's local and global efforts to create a safe society free from discrimination and violence. Maria Fernanda Aboleda is an Afro-Colombian transgender woman and activist. They are a community agent with Heartland Alliance International, an organization that works to secure the rights of marginalized groups, including the LGBTQ plus community. Aboleda delivers mental health and legal services for communities impacted by internal conflict. Marielle Franco was a Black Brazilian human rights activist and city councilwoman who advocated for Rio de Janeiro's poor Black slum communities. Inspired by her outstanding work, her murder in 2018 sparked a rise in Black women's political participation in Brazil. Afro-Brazilian women won 14% of city council seats nationwide in 2020 from 3.9% of city council seats in 2016. Agnes Makatuma co-founded Black Minds Matter to provide free therapy to Black Britons who cannot afford quality mental health services. As a mental health support worker herself, she hopes to address the structural racism that affects the healthcare system in the UK. Leading from the South is an example of a Global South financing partnership to transform power, capacity, and resourcing for women's rights organizations in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. It is hosted by four Global South Women's Funds, namely the African Women's Development Fund, Fondo Mujeres del Sul, International Indigenous Women's Forum, and Women's Fund Asia, committed to advancing policies, organizing, and dignity for marginalized women. In the courage and leadership of these and many women before and among us, we are inspired. 
We are also reminded of how enormous and critical yet under-resourced our cut-out work is. We invite us all to continue pushing this change to Thank you so much. Um, so I think before I hand over to, to Nana, um, we wanted to just invite everyone to a moment of silence um, for just one minute um, to remember the women and gender expansive persons that have led this work before us and who have also suffered some of the, the issues that we were highlighted even through the, the video clip, um, state violence, so mentioning um, colleagues like Mario Franco, so just inviting us to a moment of silence to remember those who have done this work before us and have left us. Thank you so much. Um, without further ado, I will pass this to, to Nana um, to, to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this research and for the work. Uh, I, this is a very, I'm hope, I know folks are asking about the link to the specific video with the research and statistics, but this is once again, an example of the work in particular black, that women transnationally, like the care of this research there are major entities that will tell you that this information is not available and to see it all capturing the experiences of African women and women throughout the African diaspora is very impactful. So thank you all for that. I wanna now move us on to the next part of the program where we'll have Dr. Anna Makumbi who will be speaking more to non-communicable diseases in the case of African and Afro-descendant women and gender, ex gender expansive persons throughout the diaspora. And I've dropped a link to a report from the African Women Development Fund that we'll pull from and talk talks more about this as well. So thank you, Dr. Makumbi, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana. Uh, I will also try to share my screen. Put it on. So thank you very much. Um, I, like Jimmy and Ponzo said, um, I think that we need to be humble in thinking that we represent the community, but at the same time, we need to be brave enough to show solidarity, to speak out for, for others who do not have the opportunities that we have. And the, in, in, in that tone, I want, I, in that note, I want to say that I have not labeled myself as a black feminist, but I think that I am one. And uh, uh, being in Africa, sometimes we care more about the woman part of it and less about the black due to our geography and to our circumstances. But uh, for sure, I think this is a subject that is close to my heart. So it gives me great pleasure to be among you and try to discuss some uh, aspects that I think are for reflection on women's cardiovascular health with specific focus uh, in Africa. So women's cardiovascular health, it's an area where it's very easy to show disparity in equities. Accurate data on global prevalence and outcomes from cardiovascular disease is lacking. The data that, that, that is available is usually and very probably biased because women with cardiovascular disease remain understudied, underdiagnosed, underrecognized, and undertreated. Moreover, there are several specific, uh, sex specific mechanisms for disease that are not fully understood, and this prevents good treatment and better outcomes. For several reasons, women are underrepresented in the majority of research that is done, 
particularly in clinical trials that are done to test interventions to improve care. And finally, but not less important, socioeconomic deprivation and the health illiteracy contributes substantially for the global burden of car uh, uh, cardiovascular disease in, in women because women tend to be more affected by these uh, situations. Looking at um, uh, data and where it is available, studies in the United States show that heart disease is the leading cause of death for women and men, regardless of race and ethnicity. But you can very clearly see that the, the majority of the burden is in fact in black females. It's also black males that follow, but this is a clear, uh, a clear message to tell us that it's not just because of the health determinants that are in the South, but even developed uh, countries, developed nations and developed communities have this disparity and this inequity. In Africa, we were able some years ago to show in South Africa, in the heart of Soweto study, that men uh, had a more severe disease and more cardiovascular disease for uh, some of the conditions, but importantly, and for the first time, more women than men had some types of cardiovascular disease. And one type that I try to highlight here is right heart failure, which is the failure of the uh, right side of the heart, a disease that is very rare in developed uh, areas because it's mainly related to lack of access to care in our context and also related to poor control of some cardiovascular conditions that then evolve and become very, very fatal and uh, very complicated. A wide range of contributors to this uh, specific type of heart failure exist. Some are clearly related to men, but others and predominantly related to poverty are, are more frequent in women. And one big example is this graph then tries to show you in red, representing women, the several types of this particular condition that affect mostly women. And this is something that was not uh, taken into account when we teach in our schools, when we do research in our countries. We think that uh, cardiovascular disease is, is affect uh, women in particular for several reasons, but one and one important reason is that cardiovascular risks are also sometimes skewed towards the, the female gender. So on your left, you have traditional atherosclerotic cardiovascular factors, which are the factors that damage our arteries and pro, uh, predispose us to heart, to heart failure, to heart attacks, to stroke, etc., And you see that diabetes, smoking, obesity, and overweight, physical activity, among others, are the main fact, uh, risk factors. But there, are, there have been emerging and non-traditional risk factors uh, nowadays that have been recognized. And most of them are related to women. So you look at, uh, at the right side of this panel, and most of these conditions are predominant in women, any of, of them. And this may also explain this disparity in prevalence and in outcomes in women. In Africa in particular, one specific risk factor is indoor air pollution, which is very, very much related to poverty and to low socioeconomic uh, conditions and affects women and girls from very early in their lives due to uh, particular conditions in which these women live, but also due to some practices that are more common in these poor communities. There are, however, a, a lot of myths, and these myths contribute to, neglect, to the neglect of cardiovascular care in women. Uh, 
women can have, and as I have just said, have more cardiovascular disease than men in several statistics. However, the persistent view that health related, related issues that are important to women are only defined throughout their reproductive years. The misperception that non-communicable diseases in general, but specifically cardiovascular diseases, are primarily diseases of men. And finally, the myth that cardiovascular diseases in women are an issue only important in high income countries results uh, in very uh, low uh, level of prioritization of cardiovascular disease in women worldwide. Fortunately, uh, in these last slides, I want to discuss with you some of the experiences and some of the hope that we now have, uh, either globally, as I try to show here. Uh, the Lancet Commission on Women and Cardiovascular Disease uh, calls for a shift in women's health and is discussing the importance of having uh, women's cardiovascular health as a priority. In their panel of aims, they list the areas that they aim to tackle. We expect this report to come out soon. And one of their quotes in the, the article that launches this commission says, and very, uh, very truly so, that reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease in women and improving health outcomes in this uh, population group is an, ambition, is an ambitious mission, but it's not beyond our reach. And uh, we, uh, we are hoping and look forward for this report because we think that it will change the game and it will, it will allow us to be more focused on the, the current issues that um, are important to, to women. In the Pan-African Society of Cardiology, uh, the, we also created a task force to concentrate on um, cardiovascular health in women, particularly in cardiovascular health related to reproductive health services, which are fairly available in most of our countries, but do not concentrate on the non-obstetric causes of death. And we have data to show that cardiovascular disease is the, primary, uh, is the primary cause of death apart from obstetric causes in women that get pregnant and give birth. And this is a group that is building uh, on, on an initial um, group of women and is inviting women from, uh, from all the countries in Africa to join and support the movement. The movement is, is also aiming at mentoring young female leaders on the several areas that we think are important to tackle health inequity and these disparities in outcomes from clinical work to research and to education and improvement in quality of life. Also, we have been engaging patients themselves and we have created uh, groups of women who are helping us and supporting us in education of other women who are sick and also give their voices and their experiences to, to other patients. And this has, is very important in improving the knowledge because health illiteracy is one of major determinants that also affects women more than men. Also, these groups are important to increase awareness within the society and uh, all to discuss some of the myths that women are more uh, worried about their cardiovascular disease just related to pregnancy. Because when we discuss with them in these groups, there is clear sense that they are much more worried with their dignity, their accomplishment in, other, in all areas of life. And usually these thoughts of pregnancy and uh, all linking all the outcomes to that issue is more because of fear of rejection and due to societal pressure. Finally, we have also been involving patients in leading health education because, and, and usually women from all ages, 
and we use the spaces that we have in the health system and in the community to do this. Finally, uh, we have also been trained peer educators at all levels. As, uh, uh, as mentioned before, even if we, regard, if we look at the, the health professionals and the differences between health professionals, female and male, uh, we also need support as health professionals. If you look on, in education, the same thing. So we think that to tackle these disparities and to tackle these inequities, we will need an effort from everybody. And we have been working with teachers, female teachers, female health professionals, female patients together, and uh, trying to discuss messages so that they become trainers and peer educators in each of their, uh, of their um, areas of work. So with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much to all of you. And I give uh, the, 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 the stage back to Nana. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Makumbi. The work that you are doing that you shared is so important and so impactful. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be here to even learn about it. I wanted to ask you a few questions that I've seen from the audience to get us started. Here we go. Okay. So what do you think of, or what are your or thoughts uh, on the impact of colonial and racial values on the medical field and its treatment of linking these diseases with sociological, economic, and political issues and causes? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, we, we, we in Mozambique, where my, my experience comes from, we're also a Portuguese colony, and we inherited a health system that was colonial in, in its roots. And uh, after independence, there was this kind of uh, generalization or socialization of the health system which comes with a lot of challenges because uh, being a colonial system, it was concentrated on urban areas and giving much more uh, uh, preeminence of care uh, to curative actions in the first place and to areas of disease that were important for the rich and more uh, those who could afford more. So my passion is uh, neglected cardiovascular diseases. And I do most of my work in rural areas with rural women who care a lot for their uh, families, who care a lot uh, for health uh, for themselves and who are the, the most beneficiaries of the new health system. However, I think that the mentality of the training of health professionals the mentality of the, the provision of care by those workers who are not trained to this disparity, to this inequity, and to challenge the status quo, uh, still um, a barrier as I see it. And uh, I really uh, like seeing more and more women, more and more young doctors, nurses, technicians uh, coming together because as you know, health professionals are in majority women. So I think that we have to have our own movement inside the, 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 medical, the medical field and the health sector in general. So I think that yes, there, there are still the reminiscence of the colonial system, but I think that uh, every, every country is doing a great effort to bring new insights into the systems. Over to you, Nana. Thank you so much. I actually, I had a question because when you spoke about the indoor air pollution, it's something that is so present, I think, in anybody's life who, throughout the diaspora, really, when you're working in or a part of a rural community. But it's not the, the health literacy as well, I think, was something it just stuck with me. I wanted to learn more about what has what have the conversations been like with um, the rural women that you're working with and learning more about health literacy and the impact of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And I also was curious about what government intervention has looked like in addressing some of these issues that you and so many throughout the continent have been researching? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Regarding indoor air pollution, unfortunately, um, it's ve very under studied 
and the research. But there are more and more studies showing that it is a very important health determinant. It is a very important risk factor for both cardio cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. And that it's one that is probably related more to the predominance of women's poor cardiovascular health in our continent. Uh, uh, fortunately, in 2018, the UN and WHO have included environmental factors as one uh, to be prioritized in our research in, and in, in our care for non-communicable diseases. And I think that this will allow us to understand more and more of the impact of these conditions. It's important to know that indoor air pollution um, uh, affects uh, several areas of the, the, the body, not just cardiovascular and pulmonary, and affects because of our practices and the use, uh, and the use of more um, practices that are very typical in Africa, like carrying the baby on your back, exposes children and girls from very early in life. So it's up to you to study those uh, effects, but this is work that fortunately is starting now. Now regarding health literacy, uh, I think that we need to empower women. Unfortunately, as I say, there is no uh, specific data regarding women because of the, the very traditional bias towards men in all health research that we do. But this is being corrected. Bioethics committees now, uh, more or less all over the places, have been asking for equity in, in sampling populations for studies. It's true that we continue not to include pregnant women. We do not include uh, young women uh, because of their age. But I think that slowly we are opening the field to a more equitable research that will have its impact on education and thus will have also impact from early life in the lives of the, the women that are coming. As Ponzo and Jamie highlighted, we really need to leverage what has been done. And I think that we also have to bring some innovation and some courage to change things. And to, I think that that will drive more improvement in health literacy. Because if this is not told at school, if this is not spoken within the families, uh, it's like everything is because the women are pregnant, the, the woman had a baby, the woman is weak, but there are many, many causes that are preventable, that we can improve, uh, that may change the, the, the outcomes in, in women. Over to you, Nana. Thank you, thank you. I had another question. I'm curious about your work and your experience what have been some of, aside from your own intervention, what are some of the community interventions that you've seen um, women will pull to just address their health issues, things that they're experiencing? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's, there is a lot of strength in some of the community projects that we have. Uh, we have um, seen a lot of women leading projects in nutrition. This is a very important area because the well being is defined by how you grow and how much care you're given uh, very early in your life. So I think that those are really transforming projects in agriculture, uh, projects in improving the quality of energy that is used by this woman through improved cook stoves. Unfortunately, all these are experiences that are guided by research and sometimes uh, funded by, by donors that have a, a singular vision towards results for research. But in several occasions, there is also some innovation and some uh, kind of solidarity that is brought to these projects that allow uh, different ideas and different uh, experiences to be uh, shared among women. So those would be the two areas that I think will be more impactful in terms of non-communicable diseases. New energies to replace indoor air pollution, highly uh, contaminant uh, sources, and also nutrition because anemia, uh, low growth, low birth weight, 
are all um, uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We know now that are linked to poor nutrition and poor, poor food and, uh, and health in general. Thank you. From the audience, and I think this is a very, very good question. What hurdles have you faced in accessing funds and grants to study and conduct research in areas relating to women's health issues, in particular, these rural women and just women throughout the continent? Uh, thank you. Th that's a very important question. In, and that's one that is very linked to what we know. You asked about health literacy. So health literacy is, is dependent on how much you are able to explore, to study and to bring solutions. And unfortunately, um, what is not told, what is not talked about does not exist. And when we talk about neglected diseases, which are really the diseases of the poor and the diseases of the rural and the diseases of women, uh, you have a convergence of factors that uh, in fact try to perpetuate it. Because when you have a grant that is a grant uh, uh, fund, a system that is opening for uh, applications, it's usually on issues that are known of. No one will open something for, for a, an area that has never uh, been told about. So this is something that is changing slowly. And I think that the main hurdle is many times to convince people who are in the reviewer, in the reviewers boards, who are in the donors uh, side, who never heard about this, who don't see the link between uh, indoor air pollution, poverty and having hypertension, or between poverty and having uh, um, mental health issues. So this up to now for me is the, the major hurdle. And uh, we really need support because we come from low income countries and more and more uh, the donors have been shifting through recent research that is being done with a lot of effort from women with the linkages between, between community work and health research, which is also important. More and more engagement from the communities leads to better understanding of the needs of the communities. And we try to bring those needs. So I think that the, the field will improve, I'm sure. But yes, there are several hurdles and not every time we are able to do what we want to do. But we have to find ways to interact among us. And that's what we are trying to do, for instance, with the rescue project, where, where we want to use the know-how and the funds that are available, even in low-income countries for reproductive health services to reinforce care for cardiovascular disease in women. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Makumbi. I was wondering now, I'm thinking about that um, as someone who is actively always thinking about just advocacy work, how have you worked with maybe people within the government, people, activists who are pushing for, what has that connection been like to figure out like funding either mm -hmm. pushing for funding or figuring out alternative streams of funding? Mm -hmm. uh, through the, the non-communicable diseases of poverty uh, network, we were a commission and we are now a network. Um, we are trying to have voices of patients, voices of young women, voices of women who have chronic diseases in general. Uh, regarding cardiovascular disease, those are very strong ways to reach out to the communities and to reach out to donors. And we have very strong women who are leading these associations because those are usually patient associations. Uh, they are now working in several different groups, but there is also this movement trying to bring together as part of the NCD Alliance all the small groups for several diseases that uh, are there. So at the present, we have been engaging a lot of them through this NCD Alliance, which is expected to be disseminating uh, in all countries. And these voices of patients, I think that will be 
our best ambassadors as health professionals, because we are on the other side of the problem many times. And we think that giving the, the, the stage to the patients themselves and having them empowered by us with our support, but having them giving the message to our leaders, to our politicians and to our donors, I think that is stronger than having health professionals who are not patients themselves, trying to act as patients. And this is one of the areas where we are trying to have new uh, experiences and to evaluate if they are they will be useful. But in what we are hearing from the donors of the potential donors is that this is really a, a, a better way of reaching out to them. So we have been using a lot it. And we recommend it as part of our network. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukumbi, for your time. Thank you for this presentation and for the information that you shared. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Of course. I'm going to call in Jamie now. Yes, I am coming uh, right now. I'm making sure things are good on my end and I'm we're, we're having a great conversation. Can everyone see me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, you all. So we're going, we're taking a moment just to well, for, we're taking a moment, pivoting a bit from the original agenda, but Jamie wanted to sit and have just a conversation before moving on to Dr. Caldwell's presentation to just talk more about just transnational feminist solidarities and what they mean to us and sort of the work that we've done over time. I don't know, Jamie, if you wanted to. Just jump in. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes I, I think um, so on Twitter, um, I posed the question, like, what does it mean? Uh, what is transnational, particularly in, in my case and many other cases, what does transnational Black feminist solidarity um, mean to you? And just hearing Dr. McCumbi um, speak and, and the amazing uh, presentation she gave really prompted that question because you have uh, her work in Mozambique, right? Um, and discussing all these health inequities, but what does it really mean to stand in solidarity or be in solidarity um, um, transnationally? Um, and not just talk about it, but be about it. So I was wondering like you, if you and I can just have a conversation about what um, shaped your transnational black feminist politic. Um, and yeah, like what shaped it um, and particularly with health inequities, like how did you come into this space? Because we weren't born woke, right? We weren't born radical. So how do we, how did you come into the, this politic of, of being a transnational black feminist? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's something that grows with you, probably. I cannot tell you when. Um, but we, when you have a sense of injustice, you usually try to, to give your small contribution. And I think that having the possibility of having collaborators in countries around, uh, around us and having colleagues from, from abroad, from the US, from Europe, from Ameri the Americas, uh, we saw an opportunity to build this movement, which is small, but has contributions from everybody. I mentioned to you the, the coaching and the mentorship of young leaders, young female leaders, which is basically because we said that we know that there is lack of everybody, but we want to concentrate on women. And we feel that as women, we have our own personal experiences that may be very useful to young women and to help them driving quicker than we drove to reach where we are. And th this has been done with the participation of people from all over the world, not just from Mozambique. Although the project is based in Mozambique, it's also a transnational solidarity because we get funding, we get support, in-kind support uh, from, from people uh, basically uh, and predominantly uh, women who are working outside Mozambique. So it's like you said in the introduction, how, uh, how we feel we can contribute. 
how can our own small role be in this big movement? And that's why I told you that maybe I'm not a black feminist, but I feel like a black feminist. If there is a very strict definition, I will be outside it. But if it's very open, I, for, I will for sure be one. Oh, it's open. It's open. It's you are, open. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. It's definitely open. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Makumbi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. McCumbi. Thank you so much, Jamie. We're now going to transition in the program and we will have Dr. Kia Caldwell, who will be talking about her research with Afro-Brazilian women and how they are transforming health equity and comprehensive well-being in Brazil. Thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell. And folks, just give a moment. We're gonna try to work out any tech issues we're having in the moment. Hello, everybody. Yeah, we would just like to give a few moments. Dr. Caldwell is experiencing some technical dish issues, so we are trying to figure that out on our end. So just for a, a moment of pause, and then we'll get back into the program, into the session. Thank you so much for your patience. Hi, Dr. Caldwell, can you unmute? Can you hear us? Hi, yes, I'm so sorry. I can hear you. My computer um, has been having some major problems. <laughs> no, it's so. that time. I get it. Just, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for um, working through. Yes, so I am um, I'm pulling up my slides now again here. Let's see. I'm going to try to just get to them quickly. I had to shut down my computer, so there we go. I was sharing earlier that um, I was giving a presentation or moderating a conversation and my internet went out twice. <laughs> this. <laughs> oh no. So I'm grateful for like the tech, like being able to connect far and wide, but there are times where it's like, oh my goodness, but definitely take your time. We are here and we are looking forward to all that you share with us. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I hope you all don't hear that chime in. My, uh... Okay, looks like I am working here. Everything hopefully is working. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen as soon as I can. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, the tech seems to be working now, finally. And I will share my screen. Um, so thank you so much to Jamie and Dina for the invitation to be here uh, with you today. And I would like to say that um, I am not Brazilian. Uh, and so I'm especially honored to be able to share some of um, the research that I've done and um, you know what I've observed in terms of Black women's activism in Brazil. And hopefully you can see my full screen slides there. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on African enslavement and also race in Brazil before I get started. Um, so nearly half of the 11 million enslaved Africans that were forcibly transported to the Americas 
um, were taken to Brazil, close to 5 million, right? So Brazil actually had the largest and longest involvement with slavery and with the transatlantic slave trade. Slavery existed there from the 1530s until 1888. So it was the last country in the Americas also to abolish slavery. Today, at least 56% of Brazil's population is of African descent um, in terms of uh, thinking about self-identification in the census and other national level surveys. Uh, this means that Brazil has the largest African diaspora population in the world. Um, and with Nigeria having the largest um, African descendant population in the world, right? So Brazil has the, the second largest African descendant population in the world. And I like to say the largest African diaspora population in the world, which I think is important, especially because the US um, is so prominent when we think about black communities um, on a global level. And uh, the ideology of racial democracy was prevalent in Brazil from the 1930s until at least the 1990s. And even today, it continues to be powerful, um, which means that Brazil has been seen as a non-racist society, as a society where racism is not a problem. Uh, and that has shaped things like the national census, which for most of the 20th century um, omitted collection of racial data. Um, race was not included in the census. Um, and that has also affected health because um, health records um, commonly have not included um, data by race, including with the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, it's still spotty, but it wasn't until late April, early May of last year that the Brazilian government was forced to start collecting these data by race um, because of black activism and black women's activism in particular. And there's been an argument in Brazil that color is more important than race. Um, and so I think that's important context for understanding health equity. Um, I published a book called Health Equity in Brazil for those who are interested. Um, it came out in 2017. And just as we think about health equity, I think Paula Braveman's um, definition is, is helpful and useful. And she has defined it as the concept underlying a commitment to reducing health inequalities that is systemic, plausibly avoidable differences in health, varying according to levels of social advantage with worse health occurring among the disadvantaged. Um, and then the World Health Organization has also defined equity as the absence of avoidable, unfair or remediable differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically or geographically, or by other means of stratification. So the concept of equity really emphasizes justice and redistributive justice. And I think it's also important to note that health equity differs as we're talking about today by social and also historical and cultural context. Uh, so as we think about Brazil, um, racial democracy, that ideology, as well as what I've called colorblind health policy have really shaped the context for health equity. And I think this is a great graphic um, that illustrates the difference between equality and equity. So with equality, everyone gets the same size box or crate to stand on regardless of their height. But with equity, you give people what they need as opposed to giving everyone the same thing. So the smallest boy is getting two crates so he can see over the fence. The boy in the middle gets one and the man on the left doesn't stand on a crate at all because he doesn't need it. Thinking about the Brazilian context, um, Edna Holland, who is a longtime black feminist in Brazil, um, when I interviewed her back in 1994, she was the director of the health program at Geledes, which is a black women's NGO in Sao Paulo, one of the oldest and really most prominent in Brazil. And at that time she said, we consider health to be a strategic area from the point of view of organizing the black population. We believe that when we speak about health, we are not speaking only about things, about wealth, about the objects that a person does or does not have of inequalities. When we speak about health, we are speaking about in inequalities that are inscribed, that are crystallized on the very bodies and minds of people. And I think this idea of health being crystallized and inequalities, excuse me, being crystallized on our bodies and on our minds um, is really powerful. So Black women have really been at the forefront of organizing around health in Brazil. In fact, um, reproductive justice was a major driver of Black women's organizing in the 1980s, late 1980s, as 
Brazil returned to democratic rule as civil society was organizing again following the military dictatorship there. So these are a few organizations that have, <clears throat> excuse me, really led the way for decades in terms of uh, Black women's health activism. And we can see on the right that they've been involved with issues such as domestic violence, HIV AIDS prevention, again, reproductive health, reproductive justice, sickle cell anemia, and uh, female sterilization in particular was one of the main concerns and has been one of the main concerns of Black women, uh, Black feminists in Brazil. And uh, Black women's organizations were also the first to focus on HIV AIDS prevention. Uh, and they also have been really important in terms of documenting essentially racial health disparities and gender health disparities, because these were not areas that were being focused on by the government or by public health researchers. So Black women have produced um, really important um, publications in this area and done important research in this area as well. I wanted to highlight some of the uh, ways that Black women also have been uh, involved with transnational policy advocacy, uh, Black Brazilian women. So in 1994, they participated in the UN World Population Conference, uh, also in the 1995 UN World Conference on Women in Beijing, China. In 2001, uh, Black Brazilian women really um, mobilized Afro-descendant populations throughout Latin America and Brazil had one of the largest, if not the largest, civil society delegation at the Durban Conference. Uh, Edna Holland, who I quoted earlier, um, was designated and appointed as the special rapporteur uh, during the conference as well. And then there was a World W. Carr um, Durban Review Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, um, that Black women have uh, or were instrumental in. And uh, even this year, they've been talking about 20 years uh, since Durban. So Durban continues to be an important sort of rallying point, um, particularly for, for Black women in Brazil. And then as we think about um, things sort of more at the, the national level and developments at the national level, I wanted to point out um, especially the fact that President Lula back in March of 2003, soon after he took office during his first term, created a special secretariat for women and a special secretariat for racial equality policies known as SEPIR. And SEPIR um, really came out of the Durban conference as well. And it made Brazil the first uh, country in the world to have a cabinet level secretariat focusing on racial equality uh, and racism. A lot of that has been dismantled because of the shift um, away from democracy in recent years, even before Bolsonaro came to power. Um, another really important development was the fact that uh, Black women organized and held their first national, national march in November of 2015. And it was the uh, March Against Violence and for Living Well. And you know these are health issues. These are health and wellness issues, violence, state violence, police violence, interpersonal violence. Um, those are all health equity issues, as well as this, this concept of living well, which um, was really, which really came out of indigenous communities in the Andean region of um, Latin America. And so Black women are desiring to live peaceful lives, to not be subjected to violence in its various forms, but also to live well. And as we think about the pandemic, we can also um, really consider what that means. And then over the past few years, increasing numbers, in fact, thousands of Black women have entered um, the sphere of electoral politics. And so that's another way in which they're uh, practicing their activism and their desire for democracy, for well-being. I wanted to um, briefly mention the Alini case, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and before I get into that, because it was a maternal death case, um, I just wanted to share some data about racial disparities and what's called hospital pilgrimage and anesthesia use during childbirth. Um, so when we talk about hospital pilgrimage, this is um, this term reflects that the idea that Black women have to often, or women in general, but Black women in particular, travel to more than one um, maternity ward or hospital in order to give birth because they're not always assigned to a hospital um, for when they go into labor. 
So one study found that nearly 32% of Negras or Black women, 28.8% of Pardas or Brown women, and 18.5% of white women traveled to more than one maternity hospital when they were in labor, right? So that is delaying them getting care and being able to give birth. And if we combine the numbers for both Black women and Brown women, those are women of African descent, right? So that's almost 60% of those women um, were experiencing that. 16.4% of Pardas and 21.8% of Negras did not have access to anesthesia during childbirth and 58.9% of Negras, 46.9% of Pardas and 43.7% of Brancas gave birth in public health establishments. So Alini da Silva Pimentel, um, her story um, was really tragic. Um, and it was avoidable, right? So as we think about equity, it was an avoidable, preventable maternal death. She was 28 years old. She lived in the Rio de Janeiro metropolitan area. Um, she died, unfortunately, in 2002 due to severe medical neglect and malpractice. And uh, she had a miscarriage. There was a 14-hour delay in removing the placenta. She experienced severe hemorrhaging. Um, an ambulance was not sent to get her and take her to the hospital. She ended up entering a coma uh, and was forced to wait in a hospital hallway for 21 hours uh, before being seen. Five days pa passed between the initial onset of her illness and her death. Um, and so her death really highlights the mistreatment of Black women in Brazil's healthcare system this is also an increasingly a problem in the US and in other places, as the video pointed out. Uh, so we can think here about institutional racism and also intersectional discrimination based on gender, race, and class, because she was a poor African descendant woman. And as we think about the US as a comparison, uh, maternal mortality rates are more than three times higher for Black women in the US um, than they are for white women even as maternal death rates have gone down, essentially in the US, they've gone up uh, for, for Black women. So one of the reasons why her case um, and her death is important is because the um, UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women uh, made a decision regarding her death. And uh, this was the first time that a United Nations um, entity or the CEDAW um, made sort of a ruling or a decision regarding uh, maternal mortality, maternal death. The committee stated that the grossly negligent health care provided to Alini constituted a form of de facto gender discrimination under the CEDAW. Uh, and really it brought together these intersecting forms of inequality and marginalization um, because Alini did live in a, in a city that was largely of African descent which did not have adequate maternal health care services. And the CEDAW committee found that she was subjected to multiple forms of discrimination on the basis of gender, race, and socioeconomic status. It's really noteworthy that this first decision regarding maternal death focused on an African descendant woman. So I think that that's something, you know, for us to keep in mind. Um, and the Center for Reproductive Rights was really instrumental, which is based in the US, was instrumental in pushing this um, case forward, as well as civil society organizations, Black women's organizations uh, in Brazil. In March of 2014, her mother, who's uh, pictured here in the Black outfit and receiving this certificate, um, she did receive reparations uh, for Alini's death. This was three years after the CEDAW decision. So the Brazilian federal government um, was really pressured to provide reparations to Alini's mother. However, at this point, uh, her daughter still had not received any reparations. Uh, and essentially her, her mother and daughter, Alini's mother and daughter were left uh, to live in poverty after she died because she was the, the breadwinner um, for her family. And her husband also left the, the family after her death. Alini's mother ended up receiving 131,000 um, Brazilian hay ice. So I want to um, conclude by talking about structural racism as it relates to COVID-19 in Brazil. Um, I 
co-authored a piece with um, a Brazilian colleague, Dr. Maria Edna Araujo, um, for the conversation back in June, where we uh, really argued that structural racism was driving the COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic in Brazil. Um, and, you know, as we think about public health in Brazil, there is a free universal healthcare system, the SUS, um, Sistema Unico de Saúde. Uh, the, the majority of Afro-Brazilians rely on the SUS. They do not have private health insurance, whereas many white Brazilians do have private health insurance as well as uh, access to the SUS. Uh, the drivers of the pandemic in Brazil, especially for black communities have been socioeconomic inequalities, this idea of being essential workers, which we talk about quite a bit in the US and also a lack of proper sanitation if they're living in informal housing or favelas and don't have access to clean water. Uh, some other drivers of the pandemic have been the steep decline in democracy and the lack of commitment uh, to already marginalized communities. So I think what we're seeing throughout the world is that the uh, pandemic has been heightening and exacerbating already existing inequalities and inequities. Um, this article on the right points out that the pand pandemic has deepened economic precarity uh, for Brazil's domestic workers. Um, domestic work is an important occupation in Brazil. More than 6 million women work in domestic service. Most of them are African descendant, um, and many of them have not been able to do that work. And in fact, some of the first people to die from the coronavirus in Brazil were domestic workers. Um, although the disease was brought to Brazil uh, by affluent white Brazilians who had traveled to Europe. Um, just to give you a sense, and I know many people are seeing the numbers anyway, we know that Brazil and the US are the top two countries in terms of cases and deaths. Unfortunately, as of yesterday, um, there were over 12 million confirmed cases of the coronavirus in Brazil and close to 300,000 uh, confirmed deaths. We also know that because the, um, the virus has spread pretty much unchecked in many Brazilian cities and states, places like Manaus, Sao Paulo, there are variants at least one variant um, that is also affecting other parts of the world. Uh, as we think about sort of racial disparities with respect to COVID-19 deaths, um, this is a, a graph um, that shows us that uh, when we think about pregnant women and deaths among pregnant women by skin color comparing late May to late June and early July of 2020, uh, the number of white women um, who died was much lower than the number of brown women pardas. Uh, the number of pretas was relatively low, it was definitely lower than the white women. Um, but I should also point out that pretas and pretus, people who are designated as black or who self-identify as black on the census and in other official documents um, tend to be about 6% of the Brazilian population. So they're a pretty small fraction of the Brazilian population overall. And we can also see on the far right that the number of people where their race or skin color was ignored was pretty high. And so that points to the fact that these data are not consistently being collected um, by race or skin color the way that they need to be. Uh, this chart or graph um, shows us that between April and July of 2020, um, if we look at this line at the top, which is lighter in color, uh, the number of brancos or whites uh, who died from COVID-19 went down. So there was a decrease in the rate of death for whites. However, it stayed pretty consistent for the brown population, pardus, and then we have pretus uh, at the bottom here. And these data are actually in an article in the journal Saúde and Debachi which um, Anarujo, several Brazilian colleagues and I um, co-authored, and it was published in a special issue of that journal in December of 2020. If anyone's interested, it is available online. So as we think about um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and Black women's organizing and activism, Black women have continued to be on the front lines 
um, really trying to secure the health and safety of their communities, uh, whether we're talking about prevention or now vaccine efforts. Um, it's now been shown as we think about the number of coronavirus cases in Brazil, that Brazil has had more um, coronavirus deaths than all countries in Africa, right? Uh, so it's, it's a really horrific situation as uh, Jamie mentioned earlier. And then also even with the vaccine, um, data is now showing that white Brazilians are being vaccinated at a rate of two times the vaccination rate of black Brazilians, right? And this is problematic just on many levels, but especially given the fact that black Brazilians are the majority of the population. Um, so here I've just listed a few organizations um, that are on the front lines of this work um, of addressing also things like hunger, um, food insecurity um, in the context of the pandemic. And black women have also been involved in supporting the homeless and the incarcerated during this time. When we think about food support, Oxfam Brazil is doing a campaign called Tim Jin Chicom Fomi. There's a whole website for that. Uh, people are sort of crowdfunding and doing mutual aid. The Gela Days website has several um, organizations that uh, are accepting donations. And then there's been a lot of advocacy that Black women have been involved with around data collection, pushing for the data collection, as well as testing and, and vaccine um, distribution, vaccination. So I wanted to end um, on a slightly different note, but just to let all the viewers know that I'm involved with the project, which aligns well, I think, with our discussion today on Black feminisms, and we're accepting abstracts. So that's the bit.ly link. I will also put it in the chat, but we welcome your contributions um, to this effort, which is not focused only on health, but health is a component of the work we hope to publish in the book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell, for your work. Um, this is, first of all, thank you for just everything, the way you framed from historical to contemporary is definitely and deeply appreciated. I wanted to ask a question you said in your presentation that for Afro-Brazilian women that health was the most ideal, if not the most like far reaching space for advocacy and activism. I'm wondering as a transnational researcher and, and feminist yourself, how did you end up in this space? And I, I'm really curious because I love your practice of constantly working and collaborating and making sure that like, all perspectives are heard. So I wanted to hear more about that. Yes, yeah, so how did I get involved with this work? Is that kind of the question yeah. or? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, gosh, it started, uh, this is my, my story. I try to stick to it. Uh, hearing a black Brazilian feminist from Rio, um, Joselina da Silva, um, who is a professor now as well, sociologist, but when I was in college, I heard her speak. And, um, you know, it just was so powerful for me. And, um, it helped me to realize that there were black women in Brazil, first of all, black people. I think that that is something that is still not widely enough known, even amongst African Americans in the US. And I definitely see it with my students. And so, you know, just being aware of the struggles of black women transnationally, I think was what drove me to do the work that I've been doing for many years now and trying to bring visibility, particularly to a US audience about the issues affecting Black Brazilian women. But even in Brazil, um, when I first started doing this work 25 years ago or something like that, yes, I'm dating myself, uh, people weren't talking about Black women, you know, within academia. And, you know, I've, I've had conversations with colleagues about Black women's studies in Brazil. It is becoming more of a well-established field, but I think because uh, Black Brazilians were not within university spaces, they have been excluded. Um, it was hard, it's, it's been hard to develop um, a focus on black women, black feminism within the Brazilian academy, academy in the way that perhaps we've been able to do here or in other places, maybe even the UK. So that the fact that black women were not present in those spaces um, has been a struggle. And I've definitely tried to collaborate throughout my career 
um, and, and make sure that I am contributing, but also continuing to highlight issues. So, you know, none of us expected the pandemic to happen. So perhaps some people did because, you know, because of the environmental issues, climate change and so forth. Um, but when I saw what was unfolding, it made me think about my HIV research. And some of us, I think, could see what was about to happen, right? That Black folks would be disproportionately affected. And so that's why I have kind of turned my attention more to what's been happening with the pandemic as well. If you, can you, I know like in the United States, I know informally and formally, like the mutual aid work that Black women have been doing has just been like awesome and like, so quick um, because it's true like in navigating vaccine suppression and trying to you know gather information it's been really rough i wonder what is that looking like in brazil like what are com differences similarities and have there been transnational connections of support yes um so i think that black women my impression because i i'm not in brazil but just from what i've been reading and you know watching webinars and that kind of thing is that people are just responding to things real time, right? Sort of on the ground as they unfold. Um, and I think similar to the US and perhaps other places, there have been inequities at every level of the pandemic, whether it's you know exposure, vulnerability to it, um, uh, the messaging around it, <laughs> uh, not really downplaying it, right? We saw that happen in Brazil as well as in the US. Um, testing, access to testing, access to preventive um, measures such as washing hands, sanitizing hands and things like that. And now we're seeing it with the vaccine. So I think that Black women have tried to respond along the way to all of these things as they've been happening. Um, and then also the food security issues and you know other things that are affecting communities that they can see. Um, in terms of collaboration, I don't know if a lot of that has been happening um, but I do think it's important, right? Um, especially because as difficult as the situation with the pandemic has been in the US, we're still privileged in many ways in this country. People are getting the vaccine. Um, it's been rolling out slowly, but the situation is even worse and more dire in many ways in Brazil. So um, I think, you know, collaboration, it would be good to see that amongst our governments. But when we think on the ground amongst Black feminists and um, organizers, it would also be good to see that. But I do know, you know, there was a lot of solidarity uh, if we think about racial justice issues last summer, right? There were marches in Brazil because they also had their own struggle related to police violence. Yeah. I wanted to thank you so much and then off, open up this space for all our speakers. Um, there was a question from the audience. I also wanted to ask a question to you all, but also thank you all formally for just creating this space because I am learning so much and I am just looking forward to reviewing the conversation and also all of the links and of the organizations that are shared. And so I wanted to go into the, the so there's a, a question from the audience and I think it's for all of us here who are, um, do, who are doing work as, especially along transnational black feminism, there was a ask for any comments that you have around health equity as related to sexual and reproductive health um, and what that work has been looking like within the context that you're based, where you're working, what does health equity mean for sexual and reproductive health for black women and what have been your ex experiences with such? And this is for any of our panelists. And the question is also in the Q&A feature in the Zoom. Sorry, Nana, can I just ask you to repeat the question? Sure thing, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. And I'm <laughs> that was me, not you. Not, no, no, I was no, trying not to at think all. of it as you were speaking. <laughs> yes, questions around just health equity and sexual and reproductive health for Black women and what that effort looks like transnationally. Here is muted. 
is talking, but we cannot hear. Yes, I'm sorry. I think it was Ponzo perhaps earlier who mentioned that the, the issues are so similar um, in these various contexts. Um, and several people I think have been saying this. And so I think, you know, whether we're thinking about maternal mortality, infant mortality, um, reproductive justice, you know, abortion access, the, this, the issues are very similar. And I'm not actually sure how much is happening um, transnationally, sort of between African feminists, feminists in the diaspora, Black feminists. I know that regionally, Afro-Latin American women organize through the, for example, the Red de Mujeres Afro-Latino-Americanas. Um, but I think there is a need for us to be organizing, if it's not already happening, to do more of that across these kind of national borders and even regional kind of formations. Thanks. Thank you for that, Dr. Caldwell. Ponzo? Yeah, I was just thinking very much that um, I think if we look at the kind of international sexual and reproductive rights sector, it's, it's, um, it's led by, let's say, a particular group, and I think it's been very northern globalized. Um, so I'm just looking at the chat um, and the suggestion from Nancy about thinking about developing a collective statement. I was trying to think what's something that could concretely happen that sets out what we believe, why we believe it, and how we believe it should happen. So um, in terms of where I sit at uh, the African Women's Development Fund, um, I think our, our support to the movement um, has often focused more at the national level but as we get much more of an understanding of the continental space and what's happening, and given these, given the similarities and the commonality of the issues across the transnational borders, it would seem that coming together collectively to develop a statement that sets that out would be something really good. So, I know I haven't quite answered the question about what we do do, but I'm perhaps jumping ahead to thinking about what we could do. And that would seem to me to be a really solid suggestion. That would perfect because I feel like this is just sort of a part of the tradition in the work, like figuring out not just like what we've done, but what we can do. So I'm, yeah. if we're doing this, I'm all down to support. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, um, Jamie, it looks like you wanted to jump in as well. Yes, I also wanted to kind of address um, what Ponto was talking about. I definitely agree with how there's been a certain group of, of, of people leading the conversation on sexual and reproductive health that needs to be, you know, dismantled. We certain like like I keep saying, we need to talk about and center those in our communities that are the most marginal. And when we do that, we have to also talk about like the cis heteronormative. Uh, understandings that have permeated sexual and reproductive health, right? So there's this great article by anthropologist Nisette, Nisette Falu, um, who speaks about how Black women in Brazil, Black Brazilian lesbian women, um, experience discrimination um, and prejudice when they, when they try to uh, go to the gynecologist or access um, information about sexual and reproductive health. So when we talk about these issues, we should also be speaking about once again, those who are the most marginalized um, have a gender expansive uh, understandings of sexual and reproductive health, right? Um, and, and try to see where we have uh, put sexual and reproductive health in a, not, in a binary and, and look beyond that scope, particularly when we talk about being in solidarity with uh, black and Afro-descendant women um, and marginalized genders around the world. Thank you so much for that, Jamie. Thank you so much for everything that's been offered in this space. I want to just, because we have a little bit of time, but I wanted to wrap up. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our sponsors and hosts, African Women's Development Fund, as well as Black Women Radicals. Thank you to Dr. Makumbi. Thank you to Dr. Caldwell. Thank you to everybody that's been involved in just planning this entire event. And I'm looking forward to the, just the afterwards, what it looks like to continue on in the organizing and this transnationalist 
work and tradition. So I don't know if Ponso or Jamie, you would like to give any concluding thoughts or remarks or any of our speakers overall, but I just wanted to thank you all for attending and for just sharing space. Yes, I just wanna say um, thank you, Nana, for being such a gracious uh, host and on point as always. Um, you are the best at what you do. You're amazing. Thank you so much. I wanna thank the team of the African Women's Development Fund for like just all your amazing work. Um, I'm telling you, please tap into the African Women's Development Fund. Their work is pioneering and pivotal. Just shout out to everyone. I wanna thank um, all of our panelists. I wanna thank uh, Ponso and Dr. Keila Lee Caldwell and Dr. Anna Mukumbi. Um, I want to thank Wema, Wema, even though they were not able to be here. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, I can go Dina, Lydia, Malaika. <laughs> just thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, um, I just appreciate you all so much. And I hope that after this conversation that we continue in and being diligent and our work um, and really understanding health inequities, but also solutions to, to these health, health, health inequities and how we can work together um, to build a present and future that we really do need to see so desperately. So that's all I have to say. If anyone else from the African Women's Development Fund, Ponso, if you would like to say anything. Just very briefly, Jamie, because you completely echoed everything, you said everything that I would have said, just, such a big thank you. I think for us as a fund, because solidarity both on the continent but globally is such a key important part of what we want to be doing um, and being part of, for us, this collaboration with Black Women Radicals was um, for me personally, really inspiring for us as an organization. I think exactly where we hope we now build on this I also want to say thank you to everybody who came along um, to listen to the fantastic speakers, Dr. Anna Mukumbi and Dr. Uh, Caldwell. Nana, thank you for keeping us in line. And Jamie, great to work with you. I think for me, the one thing, there's two things that I will take away. One is a massive amount of um, food for thought is probably the best word. But the second thing is very much a desire to see how we can build on today's conversation and continue it going forward. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And I'd just like to add that um, the video is available on YouTube, the video we just shared. Um, if you'd like to see it, it's still uploading. So the link is not available now, but anytime later in the day, you can visit the AWG African Women's Development Fund YouTube page and um, the video will be available for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have bye. a good one, y'all. <laughs> <Yep>. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>